What's up, Canes fans? This is the Canes Insight Daily Podcast. We told you we're kicking up the content Monday through Friday, plus emergencies. We're putting out Canes podcasts, the newest content, hitting the day's news, and also segments like today, football school with Coach Mike Zuckerman, 10-year coach and vet, demystifying a couple concepts for us every single week. So that's going to be great. The show is loaded. Brought to you by Anna Jar and Levine Accident Attorneys. Listen. Just because you watch this episode of Football School doesn't mean you're a great coach. Just because you go to law school doesn't mean you're a great lawyer. Get guys with experience, guys who've been there, dealt with your exact problem. If you've been in an accident, you could be entitled to significant compensation. 1-800-747-FREE, 1-800-747-3733. Deal with vets who know what they're doing. Take back control of your life. Also brought to you by Caneswear, uh, the number one stop for Miami sports fans. Heat, Marlins, Canes gear. Got this beautiful Canes baseball jersey. Huge discounts going for $47.83, 32 bucks off. Get it for Canes baseball season. It's beautiful. Uh, you can rock it all summer and into the winter. It won't go out of style and it is high quality. Again, 32 bucks off. Get the deal while you can. All right, now it's time for one of my favorite segments. This is football school with Coach Mike Zuckerman. If you're on the canesinsight.com forums, and if you're not, you should be on 6.7 million. Forum post and counting, busiest can community on the internet. A lot of people there really know their stuff. You got former coaches, people who played at a high level, people just really study the game of football. Then you got people that are, are still learning. Yeah, you know, I put myself in that category. And a lot of times we talk about concepts and things we're seeing on the field, and we don't might use terminology that we don't fully understand, or maybe we understood it at one point, but it's changed in the landscape of college football. Last week we had Coach Zuck on, 10-year coaching vet to talk about the air raid offense. This week, we're switching to the other side of the ball and going into the striker Sam nickel position, a very hotly debated topic among Canes fans really for the last five, six years. I can remember all those posts screaming about what Zach McLeod's doing in coverage out there on a wide receiver. So we're going to talk about that with Coach Mike Zuckerman, 10-year coaching vet, three years at Utah State as linebacker coach, who just finished up, seven years at the University of Miami, he was part of a staff that won 11 games, won their bowl at Utah State, won their conference championship. Most recently, he coached MJ Tafisi, who was an all-conference linebacker. Now he's joining the, the private world by choice, and we're lucky to have him here to talk about all these kind of things on the KanesInsight.com podcast. Zuck, how you doing? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me back. So you're at the, you're, you're not at your apartment. You're at your parents' house, right? I saw a picture of, of young Zuck in the background with the big shoulder pads. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep that hidden. <laughs> <laughs> you got to blur it out. All right. Yeah, we'll man. You know, nobody wants to see that. <laughs> Anyways, the striker position, Sam. I know you don't read the KanesInsight.com forums when you're coaching. We're lucky to have you as a, as a reader and a lurker. I know your name. I won't tell anybody uh, when you're not coaching or when you're a student at University of Miami. But – I know you heard it either on Twitter or just talking to fans about what's you know what's the striker, why why Zach McLeod covering this this slot receiver, what's going on here. So we really want to dive in and start with the basics, which is if we're talking about a strong side linebacker. What is the strong side? Gotcha. Yeah, and let me say this before you get me in trouble. Like once I actually got very involved in football, I was off the message boards, man. Like that that's a real thing. That if you read that stuff as a coach. I mean, you're just going to end up messing. It, it, it's useless information, whether it's Twitter and even at Utah State. Believe it or not, there's Utah State message boards. And if you read that stuff and start to get down on yourself or even reading the praise on yourself or anything like that, that's a recipe for disaster as a coach. So, you know, I tried to that, – that was uh, back before I got fully involved. But um, to get back on track, so the strong side, and that could be actually defined as a couple of ways. So the strong side essentially – there's either a tight end strength or a passing strength. And when coaches talk about a tight end strength, that means that whatever side the tight end is on is where that Sam linebacker is going. If you're setting the Sam to the tight end strength. So that means essentially wherever the tight end is, no matter how many other receivers are on that side, that is what you are considering the strength of the offensive formation. Um, in today's world, you know, with so much 11 personnel, meaning one back, one tight end, three receivers, which is the number one personnel grouping you see in offensive fo in uh, college football nowadays. Um, a lot of times the passing strength is used, which means the side that has the most receivers, not necessarily where the tight end is. So the tight end could be the boundary 
But if there's two receivers to the field, that is the strength, and that is where the Sam will go. So it's really just how the defense wants to define it. And sometimes you have certain calls that use different strengths. Like you could have a call that's based on tight end strength. You could have a call that's based on passing strength. You could have a call that's strictly based on field and boundary, and none of the offense matters. So all that is just essentially declaring what you are considering the strength for that specific offensive formation. And that historically has told the Sam where to go. Weak side obviously would just be the opposite, the side where opposite the tight end or where there are less wide receivers. Now, when you talk about tight end strength, if it's 12 personnel and you got two tight ends on the field, how does that play out? Uh, most of the time, that's by call. A lot of times, by default, it makes the field, the strength, and uh, the boundary, the weakness, just by default because it's a balanced formation. Um, sometimes people have a tendency where with two tight ends, one is the run tight end and one is always away from the point of attack. You know, I, I think a lot of times offenses don't even realize they have a tendency like that but sometimes you will use a specific tight end as the strength and set him. So that's kind of something you get into by game plan. And also sometimes by defensive call, it's a little different, just whether you want to declare the strength as the field or the boundary when it's balanced. But that, that, that that's actually a great question. Well, I know, and I'll ask you to talk about this, but Miami probably has some of those tendencies uh, with the way their tight ends are set up. Some of them strictly blockers. Um, we'll see how that plays out this season. But so now we know what the strong side is. And the next natural question is, what is a strong side linebacker and how has that position evolved since you first got into football? Right. Um, so when you're watching football, you know, obviously back in the day, everything was I backs, right? Like you, you had I backs and everyone was just in a phone booth playing football and you had your three linebackers in the box to stop the run. So initially a lot of that strength was based on tight end strength. Okay. So with the tight end strength, you want your Sam linebacker who is going to be at the point of attack for a run. So this was originally your biggest, strongest linebacker. You know, this guy needed to be able with a fullback coming at him to be able to jack that fullback up. Like a lot of times you're coaching that dude, like this fullback needs to be on his, uh, needs to be on his butt when you hit him. Um, like you need to jack him up. Um, sometimes you're putting him on the edge outside of the tight end and he needs to be able to set an edge on the entire defense, you know, with his hands or with his shoulders or whatever, however you're coaching it, that guy needs to be strong enough to hold point and play almost like a nine technique defensive end, meaning a guy on the line of scrimmage outside. Um, and then he also probably needed to be able to play man on the tight end. So your biggest, strongest and have some ability to run linebacker was your Sam linebacker, you know, and that guy was strictly going to set. Like your will linebacker was a guy who could more avoid blocks and run over the top and be fast. And that guy was going to be in a collision almost every single play. And speaking in UN terms, when Miami signed Shaq, Mike Pickney, Zach McLeod, the idea was they'd all play together. At least that was the vision from the fan base perspective. I know you were on the other side. You were at Miami when this all took place. Which one of those players was – what you would consider the Sam linebacker in terms of prototype and, and what you, what the vision was. Yeah. So the Sam was, you know, if you were thinking about those three is Zach McLeod is kind of your prototypical Sam long, probably six foot three, 230 pounds could run, could cover a tight end and wanted to hit everything that moved. Like he, he is exactly what you, you were thinking about. I go back to thinking about, and I'm sure you watched some of those spring practices, the first coach Rick spring. I mean, there was a lot of eyebacks and just old school. We are going to smash. Like it, it was, it was honestly a lot of fun to be a part of. But like there was, you know, the the first day they put in in, in your traditional power play, the fullback kicks out the Sam. So yeah, like, it was Williams, like exactly, right? what's up? Yeah, Marquise Williams, right? The yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if he was, there, especially yeah, fall camp for sure. I don't know if he was there yet in the spring, okay. but I mean. He, he was a powerful dude. So that was like, you're Sam linebacker, especially in, in now. And it's not like nobody plays 21 or 12 anymore. I mean, you look at the Big Ten, it's all over the place. Uh, we had to play Wyoming two of the three years were at Utah State. They're as old school as it gets, playing with a true fullback. So that dude needs to be able to take that guy on and really just over and over and over again in that game. you know. And he has to win that one-on-one -on -one battle. So, I mean, 
you know, your old school Sam, and that would be Zach McLeod like that. He he was so good at that. And, you know, even if you were going to be playing a 3-4 defense where that guy's an on-the-ball guy, it's similar to where you want a big, strong dude that's going to set the edge on that tight end. Or if they're going to bring a fullback outside to block that outside linebacker, it's almost a very similar position. You know, that guy, I mean, exactly like you're saying, Zach was perfectly built for like that old school Sam linebacker. So McLeod is interesting to me. I mentioned some of this in your intro is being on the boards like, like I was and some of the listeners were, or people just were on Twitter or, or wherever Canes were talking. When McLeod would line up in coverage very far away from the formation, it drew a lot of eyeballs. Why is this big, strong, physical linebacker out here with the receiver? So for the fans that are listening, obviously, look, you guys think about all these things. You guys know what's going on. How did Zach McLeod end up so far away from the formation going against players who, in a passing situation, would seem to outmatch him? Yeah, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not going to get too much into the exact – I know I know people would really love all that, but I'm not going to get too much just into, like, trade secrets and things like that. But oh, no, from I a mean, layman's just, point of view – yeah, no, I get anyway, it. From I mean, a layman's not, point of view – like you're saying, hey, Zach should yeah. be covering this guy because he's a great cover exactly. guy. No, no, no. There's a football and, reason and, why that takes place. And I understand how it looks, but essentially what you have to understand is where college football bobbed to, right? Like you had eye backs. That's what it was, you know, and then basically, or you went to 12 personnel and essentially your second tight end is a fullback. It, all you did was take that dude who was a fullback in the backfield and move him to the line of scrimmage on the other side or as a wing outside the tight end. But it's always really the second tight end is a fullback. It's the same thing. Well, what happened was, and if really, when you're really looking at offensive football, OK, they just that extra guy has now just moved out to the slot. So there's one more guy out there and then your tight end a lot of, in a lot of cases actually has moved off the ball and that's become your fullback. So you see all this like the a lot of times you'll see that why off the ball insert into the line or slice back across the line or just cut off on the backside. And all they are, all those plays are really tr- tr- uh, really still true two back run plays. They've just removed one guy from the box and split him out as a slot receiver. So the thing is, when it, it, it's not like the run game's changed, the what's changed is that now you have that slot out there, and originally it was just like bubbles and things like that. But there were ways to you know have a run and then throw the ball out to that bubble, which put so what you needed in that space out there. Yes, it was still a Sam linebacker, but if, you needed I to be able to. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. Sorry to cut you up, but I don't, I don't want you to lose no. that concept. Okay. When you say there are ways to have a run play and get that bubble, elaborate on that because I think I know where you're going with that. that okay. Work. So essentially what people started doing, and it actually is fun. So like I, my, my pet project, and it's been since Paul Johnson was at Georgia Tech, he's like, I study the hell out of the triple option. I, I just love it. You know, if I was if I was to restart my coaching career, I'd be a triple option offensive coach. But things didn't go that way. Um, but essentially it used to be, you know, triple option is dive, quarterback, pitch right? And then people started running the zone read. And then what people realized is you could take that slot receiver and just bubble him, which is literally just a backpedaling route, which creates like a half circle behind the line of scrimmage. And that is your pitch phase. So it's core, it's dive quarterback, throw the pitch. And what happened is if you are in an 11 personnel formation, you know, people were still stacking the box. You had your three linebackers in there. Well, okay, that means if you have three linebackers out there, that means you only have two DBs over two wide receivers. And if you say my two are better than your two, I'm going to throw the ball to that slot receiver. We're going to block one, and we're going to make the other miss and get a lot of yards. So because that's happening, and now people don't want to play two over two, regardless of what defense you're playing, even if that Sam's responsibilities are inside, you need some presence out there over number two. So a lot of times it can look like that Sam linebacker. Like, why is the Sam linebacker all the way out there? Well, the Sam linebacker is out there so that he can do two jobs. He provides presence for that bubble RPO type game while he can still, most of the time, that gap will move towards him if they're running the ball that way and he can fly in and make a play. Or he's actually out of the run fit and playing as a quarterback player, which we can get into a little bit while um, a little bit later. Um and, you know, and it's just kind of based on coverage 
what that Sam's doing out there. But essentially what you're doing is you're creating your disguise, you're providing presence, you're allowing that guy to be out there for pass responsibilities um, and be able to play both. So a lot of times if you say like, oh, what's the Sam linebacker doing out there? Well, you need that presence out there so the defense, one, doesn't know what co- – I'm sorry. So the offense, one, doesn't know what coverage you're in. And two, that if they do throw something or anything, you've got three defenders to defend too. So, you know, very rarely I would say – are you going to put a true Sam linebacker in true man coverage without any type of help? A lot of times if it's a tight end out there, I mean, yeah, like you, you would think your Sam linebacker, hopefully if he's a true Sam can run with most tight ends. Cause I, I would say there's very few true, like, you know, monster tight ends in college football. So that that's kind of why you'd see him out there. And that's just with the evolution of the game, why you need a Sam linebacker out in space. And we're going to get to that. The picture we're looking at now, do you explain mm-hmm. that just what we're looking at? Yeah, that? of course. So this was just kind of going back to that true Sam. So what you can see here, and then I, and I think you guys can help me out with the pointer. So the Sam in this picture, this is a true old school eye back formation. The Sam here is that guy kind of at the top of the screen. You can see him right outside the tight end, a little bit off the line of scrimmage. And I, I, the coach of me is angry because he's actually supposed to be more tucked in here, but it, it's fine. <laughs> it's a good picture that demonstrates the point. Um, so that guy is getting ready to either be an interior fitter right there with the safety you can see behind him fitting outside, or he'll fit outside and that safety will fit inside. But you could see he's there to be an in, just a run stopper right there to that tight end run strength. Now with the fullback, you could see he's cheated weak over here, so he's probably not coming back. But if he did, he'd be the guy to set the edge there, and he'd work in conjunction with that safety. But that's a bigger Sam. Like you could see right here, UConn is in 21 personnel, meaning they have a fullback, who that fullback actually might be familiar to Canes fans. That is, um, uh, what's his name? Gulliver's finest, Robert, Robert no, Gulliver's Robert Burns, right? Yep. He got an NFL yeah. camp at his fullback. Good for him. No, he, he was actually a really good player for them that year. But um, so that's a fullback, a tight end, and two receivers, meaning 21 personnel. Um, So we have our bigger Sam in there, our true Sam. You know, we're matching personnel with them to to stop the run. So when I think of true Sam, that's kind of what I think of. That's kind of the picture you should think of, three linebackers in the box getting ready to stop the run. Um, All right, so we're going to set up our next picture here. And I wanted to – we're talking about McLeod and and how he ended up because of – which is really interesting, that that new school triple option – going further out to support the interesting thing about McLeod and why I think he's such a perfect example for all this is Manny was his defensive coordinator all five years. It was a six. He was there for a while, right? He was there from 16 to 20 to 21. Yeah, and then, he, then with the COVID year, he came back right. another. Yeah. So from, he was coached by Manny the whole time, either as defensive coordinator, head coach started off as a Sam finished off as a defensive end. So that to me is telling about the evolution of the position and what was required. So you guys, you ran into the problems that we're talking about as far as offense is changing. You didn't just stand around. You adjusted. And of course, 2018, one of the best defenses Miami's had in some time. Talk to me about that evolution of the striker position from where it started in 2016 to what happened in 17, eight, and then, eight, then finally in 18. Hmm. So in 16, especially, like, I don't know if you remember, three true freshman linebackers starting. I mean, we basically, you know, and I think this is a big thing for coaches. We're like, we need to keep this simple. So we, we did our base stuff. We didn't put too much. We didn't really care if we were giving away disguises and things like that. And we played with those three because that was our best grouping. And, you know, it, it was more traditional 4-3. And offense was kind of hadn't truly jumped to, like, all the different RPOs you see nowadays. In 17, you started to see it a little bit more. And then I think you started to see a little bit more our evolution because we played more true nickel. That's where you sometimes saw Trajan Bandy in there in the nickel spot. And essentially where that, you know, that kind of led to is, okay, and you saw this around college football. This wasn't just a Miami thing. I know we called it the striker, but it's just really how can we create a hybrid Sam, a guy who can play the pass and play the run, be big and strong and can run and do multiple things, which allows us to be multiple in coverage because now – not only is that just a Sam linebacker out there, what your hybrid allows you to do is, okay, he can do all that Sam linebacker stuff, but now we can put him in coverage and do some different things in coverage. We can put him on number two. We can buzz him out to the flat. You know, you, some people, you know, can run that guy deep. 
and use him as this guy. So by having a guy who can do all those things, that's where, you know, like Miami called it the striker, but your hybrid Sam allows you to be more multiple out of a 4-3 structure. Some people refer to it as a 4-2-5 in that case, which I, I have a, you know, I, I have a definition of what the difference between a 4-2-5 and a 4-3, which we can get into later. But that that's where you really start to get into all that stuff. Um, and I think that's necessary with offenses having so many tools nowadays and so many different ways to attack you with RPOs, the more you can do coverage-wise and disguise with that guy over the slot wide receiver, the more you know you can create, present problems for the offense. You can see in this picture now, again, um, that, that guy who's walked – when I say he's walked halfway between two and three, what that means when I say two and three, from defensive football structure, you always count – eligible wide receivers from the outside in so the guy at the top of the screen on the 30 uh, yard line on the numbers that's number one the slot is number two that tight end on the ball is number three so you can see like that slot in this picture is halfway between two and three because what that allows is again he's a presence on the rpo he's um an outside run fitter for any type of run or quarterback pull or things like that and he can do multiple things you know and then the beauty of with the hybrid is you can take that slot guy, you could make him, you could buzz him out, meaning run him outside number two, and you could drop that safety inside and he could be a run fitter. So there's a lot of different, or this guy could play man on that slot. But when you say a hybrid Sam, he's doing all of these things. You want him to be able to tuck in and play the run. You want him to be able to pop out and play man on number two. You want him to be able to zone drop to the flat. So that that's what your hybrid allows. You now have, Hopefully, if you have the right guy, all of the positives of a Sam and a nickel without ever having to change personnel, you know, and that that makes it hard on an offense because they can't be like, oh, let's just pick on this guy, you know, or we know, you know, okay, we go to 11 personnel. They're going to go to nickel. Now we're going to run the ball because we have either a safety or a nickel as an extra fitter when they don't know that you're going to do that. Now that, you know, it presents some problems for them and doesn't give them any schematic advantage. So what you just described, put into player terms here, as far as Miami players who you would consider hybrid safeties and what they were asked to do while, while you were with the program. Mm -hmm. So this was Romeo in 2018 and 2019. Derek Smith played that spot. Um, I believe I, I wasn't there. I believe Amari Carter played that spot in um, 2021, which I think, you know, those are all guys who are exactly what you're looking for. Um, I don't know, you know, we kind of talked about this before, and I don't know if you want to touch on me yet. When I think of like the prototype hybrid Sam, I don't know if you remember Isaiah Simmons at Clemson. You know, we st I studied their defense one year, and that dude, I mean, he was like 6'4, 6'5, 220, could run, could play man to man, could rush the passer. And when when, when you have that guy, he can also rush the passer because now all those things I just talked about, plus you can bring that guy off the edge and he can create a pass rush, or you could blitz him inside of the defensive end, and you can do all types of stuff. That to me, he is the prototype. Like, if you can get a tall, long, can run, tough against the run, tackles well, and pat, and can play man-to-man -man on number two, like, that's your unicorn. And that's why those guys you end up seeing with, like, the five-star rankings. And, I mean, they're hard to find, you know. If you're really recruiting for that spot, what you're looking at is big high school safeties. You know, like Romeo is a good example of that. Derek Smith, same thing. You want a guy who is – long and can run and maybe not the fastest but his length is going to make up for that speed on the slot guy and um he's going to continue to grow into that spot so he can be sturdy in the run game but still can move well enough and a lot of times you're recruiting a safety to become that spot now last year i know you're a big fan of, of lance gidry you've had a chance to review miami's defensive film i won't get into too much specifics but we saw what most fans would consider a true nickel into Corey couch on the field quite a bit. So, uh, Pete, if you could pull up the, the true nickel picture. That, to me, was really what we saw, at least from the fan perspective. Again, you watched the film. You could talk to me more. That's what we saw on the field a lot. So what are some of the – now we're talking about last year. So this is as modern as it gets. Mm -hmm. the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of having a true nickel on the field the majority of the time. Yeah, and, and it's funny because you said that, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. This is actually – so this is us last year, and I don't know if you – so we were running a different scheme. You know, I was under a new tree, but we were playing with a true nickel at Utah State last year. And in this picture, you can see that guy over is now fully over number two. 
Now that guy has no resp- run responsibility whatsoever. And the guy who's actually responsible on the edge for our run responsibility is that deep safety because he's standing on the X on the 35 yard line. Because when you have a true nickel, a lot of times that guy's either another corner or, you know, like a re- just a strong athlete and you know, I mean a better athlete. And he's probably smaller. Like that guy in the slot for us is like 170, 175 pounds. So we don't want him going in there and having to play the run. So now his leverage is outside number two with that safety inside number two allowing to fit. And you actually see this a lot in college football nowadays. Some people will, and you still can put that nickel inside and have him do all of those hybrid sand things. But when I think of true nickel, the majority of the time you're taking him out of the run fit. The weakness, I mean, the the positives of that is you can see those two guys surrounding number two is that really takes away any RPO threat. Because now if two runs the bubble, you have a guy outside. If he wants to run what I call a glance, which means it's like a five-step slant by that uh, slot receiver, you have a guy at depth, you know, who's in that window and it's not a free look for the quarterback. The weakness is, as I said, is when people see that you're going to put that nickel outside of number two, they know you're using a safety in the run fit. So they are going to do everything they can to attack that safety and try to put him in conflict somehow, whether it be deep play action or something like that. Or they're going to try and pull guys and everything just to get big people on your safety and attack him in the run game. So I think what it is is you have when you're playing with a true nickel, you have to be able to introduce him enough to where, you know, just so they can't say every time that they're going to be able to, you know, that he's out of the run fit and he's not involved in the run game. or And then you have to play with those two safeties, which one is involved in the help. Because you can see right here, you have that guy to the field and we're playing kind of a too high concept, so they're both involved. But you need to play with where your support's coming from, whether it be a field safety, a boundary safety, whether the boundary corner and a cover two concept, things like that so that they can't always know where you're supporting in the run game. We're kind of getting off, but I want to ask you this question. We've talked about general run principles, and we're going to have that podcast down the road and really dive into what the, the science of stopping the run. But one term that I hear a lot, and I don't know if – I mean, I, I want to understand it, but I know a lot of fans do, is the concept of, of a force player and how that plays into everything that we've been talking about today. Mm-hmm. Well, a force player is essentially the edge of the defense. And that guy has to keep everything inside of him. Um, you know, there's there's different ways, obviously, to force. There's some and, – and it's funny, it goes back to my year at Rutgers. I thought we had some good words. I mean, you have – like a lot of times people use the word sky support, meaning sky for safety. Your safety is turns everything back. And all this is determined by coverage. Right. There's no like we play a four three. This guy's the, the force. The force is whoever's the outermost guy in the coverage to send that, you know, that he has to send the ball back to everyone else. So if you're in a quarters type concept, it's either going to be your Sam or your safety kind of based on formation. You can see in that last picture, the safety was the support, but you can flip that and put the Sam nickel hybrid guy inside. And then it's like backer support. A lot of people use the word. That's your support. Um, you can, if you're playing a cover two concept, a lot of people use the word cloud support. That means your corner is your extra, is your force player. He's going to send everything back. And whoever your force player is, is going to determine your fits for the rest of the defense. Like a lot of times when you play single high, you drop that safety in, in multiple spots. So if you drop the safety in outside of the nickel, that bumps the nickel, the mic and the will over to the boundary. If you drop the safety in outside the will to the boundary that bumps the will, the mic, and the nickel strong to the field, you know? So that kind of determines your gap structure and who's supporting what will lay out. You know, your, your coverage dictates how you're going to fit the run, essentially. Got it. So you touched on this a little earlier, and so get back to it, so now we're back to it. The 4-2-5 versus the 4-3. Mm-hmm. How do you see that distinction? I, I think the best way it's ever been put to me, because I was kind of more exposed to a true 4-2-5 this year, is in a 4-3 or even a 4-3 nickel. That nickel is over number two and has he is doing Sam linebacker type responsibilities, meaning playing man on two, playing inside of two and in the run fit or things like that. And if they put the formation into the boundary, 
meaning that there are two wide receivers to the boundary side. The nickel is either going to travel, meaning he runs over to the other side of the formation, or he's going to bump into the box and the will linebacker will walk out. But the structure of the defense, the nickel, uh, nickel slash Sam, Mike, and Will are always going to do the same jobs in a true in a four three or a four three nickel type deal. When I think of four two five, that nickel is now also going to play like a safety. So if those receivers go into the boundary in a true four two five, and this is kind of Gary Patterson's tree of defense, the boundary safety is now going to roll down. The field safety is going to bump over and play boundary safety, and the nickel is going to go back and play safety to the field. So in a true 4-2-5, that nickel has to know a lot because he's not only going to be doing his nickel responsibilities, but he's going to basically have to know the job of field safety as well because you're really now truly playing that guy as a third safety in some scenarios. So to me, that that is the major difference. Um, the principles are all still the same. You know, whether you, it's still you're going to have three underneath defenders or four underneath defenders or five underneath defenders, and that's going to then deep defenders based on all that. But just what you ask that guy to do. And I, I think, you know, when done, it, there, there's pluses and minuses to both of them, but it is you need to have a really special guy who's really smart to be able to be a true 425 nickel, in my opinion. And what are some of those plus and minuses? So, again, it, it's so. When you play a true four two five, I think the plus side is one way, a common way people attack a four three. If you're if you're not if you're not going to put your nickel deep, is they'll put the formation into the boundary in order to get that nickel either to walk into the box and now he's got to fit the run, which all of a sudden you've got a guy who's not used to being in the box in the box and he has to take on big linemen and fit interior gaps and things like that. Or if you're flipping your defense, especially if they're going tempo, that's hard because you could have your nickel to the field and then he's got to run all the way to the boundary and everyone's got to flip. And then in tempo situations, that gets very hard and it can wear out your nickel because that's a bunch of hidden yardage in between the game. He's sprinting across the field and everything. You know what I'm saying? And that's a guy you need to be, you know, he's got to be ready to play man on a slot fade at any time. He can't get tired. Um, so the plus of, playing in a true four two fives they can't get you that way because okay the receiver went in the boundary nickel goes back safety goes down safety bumps over and and the backers can just stay in the two inside backers the mike and the will can just stay in the box um if it becomes if you're playing four two five again now the disadvantage is that nickel like i said has to know all of the safety adjustments and then if they're going to start in the boundary and motion back to the field, how are we going to unwind all of that and all the checks and everything? It essentially makes your nickel have to know a lot of safety checks and communication. And that takes a lot of work, which makes it hard to then, you know, have different adjustments into the boundary. Like that takes a lot of investment because for everything you're investing in, in my opinion, you, you can't do everything. So everything you invest in, you got to take something else out. So it allows you, I think, well, create some multiplicity within what you're doing. I think it'll you have to spend a lot of time on it and maybe not be able to be as multiple in terms of how many different calls you may have. Yeah, it sounds to me like the four two five is almost like it's not like a hobby, it's a lifestyle. You have to be someone like Patterson who's at a place for a long time, recruits exactly what he needs, and it's not using other people's players and trying to get the the most out of it. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, correct. I mean, it's the same thing. The the, the most obvious example is like, you know, someone's like, Oh, wow. Well, why don't people do like a little bit of triple option? You can't do a little bit of triple option. You have to live in that world. Same thing, you know, it, it, if you're going to play tons and, and people do it, but like you can't, I, I'm just a big believer in less is more. And, and that's the tree I came up in. And that's, you know, the, the get really, really, really good at some things. And because in the end of the day, college kids, it's not the pros. You can't meet all day long. You can't cut people if they don't learn the playbook. Like you have your players, so you need to get them really good at what you got. And you have an hours count. You know, I don't, I don't know what everyone's doing. You know, it gets into all that. But in the end of the day, you have an hours count. You only have them for a certain amount of time. And college kids have a lot of other stuff going on. They got tests. They got, I mean, think about you in college, how much crazy stuff you were worried about that doesn't really matter. But you were. And that's a real thing. And, you know, you can be the best ever on the chalkboard and install tons of things. But if your kids don't execute it on Saturday, you're getting fired straight up. So, and look, I'm going to say this is not Mike Zuckerman talking. This is 
This is me talking. When, when Miami fans hear the word multiple, at least me, I think back to 2014, 2015, a lot of big, fast, long-time NFL players playing some some pretty poor defense because they were doing too many things. Again, this is me talking. I'm not going to put you on that spot, but um, I hear what you're saying. So I want to transition to something I heard Coach Gidry say after practice, and I did a little bit of this on, on last podcast. This was the Five Things We Learned podcast. You can check it out on YouTube. And one of the things I mentioned was that we are basically – using two types of players for this position. This is really what spawned this whole idea to do this podcast today, which is that Coach Gidry said that when Miami is playing base, they are using a Bobby Pruitt, which is a safety slash linebacker, true freshman, a Bobby Washington, a 4-3, uh, very fat, or sorry, 4-4 runner, linebacker, who could really, really go, and Caleb Spencer, another safety slash linebacker. And then when they play the nickel, Mish Powell, who's the free safety in base, came up as a corner for Washington before moving to safety, then becomes the nickel. So you basically have two types of players. What does that mean when you say base versus nickel? I mean, I know you're not working under Gidry, and I know it's you don't want to assume things, but when he's saying this is one position in base and it's another position in nickel, what, what's he mean? So when you're talking about switching between base versus nickel, that's basically kind of you're preparing to play against different offensive personnels, and you're going to determine – you're basically going to figure out what is the best way to stop that offense this week. Like if they're going to play in 21 and 12, you don't want your nickel out there because they're going to be in the box. You want big people who can stop the run, and those true Sams should be able to stop the run as well as play man on tight ends and things like that. Um, you want a big physical guy in there. You know, at the same time, some people are in 11 personnel – but they really don't throw a lot of RPOs and are still running the ball a lot. So if a team is not going to really put the nickel in stress and you think your safeties are good and corners can hold up out there, get another run defender in there, you know, make them have to pass the ball, you know, against your better matchup. So that's what you're talking about in terms of base. And then now you have your nickel option too, which if you feel that, you know, like I remember it was with – um. You know, even in 2016, Florida State, when they went 11 personnel, it was like 85% pass or something crazy like that. So we went nickel because if a team's not going to stress you in the run game, then yeah, get that extra that get that extra um, corner in there or somebody fast who can cover to defend the past. You know, a lot of that's about playing percentages. And really what that just shows you with Coach Gidry is he's adjusting to he he's adjusting to his personnel. You got guys who have different skill sets and different abilities and can do different things, find ways to get them on the field. Cause another thing that that really helps with in um, college football nowadays is okay. This guy's the starter in base, but now you have a nickel starter. Now you have a, this package starter. And that way all of a sudden you got 15 starters and guys who have roles because when a guy doesn't have a role and never plays now at the end of the season, you're trying to keep, and you really like him, but he just wasn't on the field yet, even though he has some skill set. Now you're trying to keep him from going in the transfer portal because he didn't play as much. Whereas you keep a guy involved, and even if, you know, one, he's happy, he's considered a starter or something like that. Two, um, two, um, was, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, if a freshman isn't ready to handle the whole package yet, but they can start in a specific package, you know, like if they can handle like one personnel grouping, that's a great way to get a guy on the field and bring him along. So, you know, having those multiple personnel groupings in college football nowadays too, I think is beneficial for many reasons. So but when you say, but base, the terminology doesn't necessarily mean this is what we're in the majority of the time, right? It's really focused on, on stopping the run first. That's the base. Yeah. You're, you're just strictly saying like, you're just strictly saying that this is going to be our big, you know, four, three personnel, essentially, you know, you, you go into a game every week, you look at what the offense is doing say, okay, there's a nickel game. It doesn't base doesn't mean like it, it does have a couple of different definitions. Cause you could talk about your base defense, but like you could be a base nickel team, but then also you could be your personnel grouping can be base. You know what I'm saying? Like base is used interchangeably as one, as the thing you do the most. But when you talk about it in terms of a personnel grouping, you're saying that this is like base in terms of true three linebackers, four DBs. 
Hey, Coach Zuck, appreciate you. Remember, like and subscribe to this podcast. You're going to have football school content like this every single week. Learn a lot, you know, demystifying some of these terms. Got a cameo from your dog. What's your dog's name? Uh, Callie. She's the best. Callie. Had a cameo from Callie. She can join <laughs> us next week. We'll figure out something to talk about. But uh, what, was she, what was she chiming in on? Was she, did she have an opinion on something? Yeah, you know, she's um she's a big four two five proponent, you know. <laughs> just which whichever defense gets her the most food. <laughs> well, listen, right now it's the Kansas Inside Podcast. So hey, Coach Zuck, appreciate you. We will see you next week. Remember to like and subscribe. And if you have any questions, if you, there's concepts you want coach to break down, let us know. Hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, or the Kansas Site.com forums, and uh, we'll have some fun. So again, coach, thank you, and uh, we'll see you, we'll see you next week, and we'll see everybody else tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.